All right, folks. Well, we will get started just two minutes after one. It's so wonderful to be with everybody this afternoon uh, and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to November's uh, Tech Talk, Network Tech Talk, and our Tech Night, albeit occurring uh, today in the afternoon. Uh, it is so wonderful to see everyone digitally this afternoon as we are being broadcasted virtually via Zoom. For those of you who have not attended in the past, Central Maine Tech Night is a monthly, typically evening event where in our small group setting, founders and leaders share real advice on how they overcame challenges, capitalized on their target market, and developed their product, providing you with actionable insight for your own products and processes. You may find us on Facebook or online at centralmain.org at the Tech Night tab. I would like to thank our sponsors for this afternoon. This free event is presented by the Central Maine Growth Council and is sponsored by CGI, Thomas College's Harold Alphon Institute for Business Innovation, Valley Beverage, and Bricks Coworking and Innovation Space located at 10 Water Street in the Hathaway Creative Center, downtown Waterville, Maine, uh, which is our typical location. Uh, November's Network Tech Talk is with the uh, Boston Fed uh, Working Cities Challenge uh, Initiative, a groundbreaking effort to provide places with economic opportunity and purpose. Uh, this will be uh, a general presentation and I also want to be uh, clear at the onset uh, that this will be principally uh, educational in nature and uh, while we are as a local region, uh, probably fair to say, toe dipping into wanting to review an application. Uh, this is not intended to be uh, the beginning of any sort of uh, community planning charrette, nor uh, is the goal of today to come out of this meeting having identified a theme or a specific project that will end up being within an application. Uh, with that said, uh, we will be welcoming uh, Peter of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston uh, about this initiative, local leaders can do a lot to create economic opportunity and include more, resident, more residents in that opportunity when they're working and learning together. Peter from the Working Cities Challenge initiative will talk about the Working Communities Challenge to advance local collaborative efforts that will help build strong, healthy economies and communities in Maine's rural towns, regions, and smaller cities. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the historical context of the Working Cities Challenge initiative is a grant competition designed to advance collaborative leadership in smaller post-industrial cities to transform the lives of their low-income residents. Uh, this initiative was launched in 2013 and the competition benefits many resurgent communities in Massachusetts and has also expanded uh, in recent years to Rhode Island and Connecticut uh, with the eventual goal of spreading across the entire region and now, of course, in Maine. Uh, so with that said, and uh, maybe if it's all right, uh, if I could do just a verbal poll um, or folks can drop into the comments section or the chat feature, how many folks uh, with us today are familiar or have heard of the Working Cities Challenge Initiative? I'll just pause here for a moment. I don't see a ton of hands. I see uh, a few, I have heard a lot. Um, so it looks like we have a, a mixed group of some folks that have not heard uh, about this initiative, some that have maybe uh, heard high level, uh, macro level about the initiative. Uh, so I think this will be a really nice opportunity again uh, to overlay some education as to better inform uh, our partners, our communities uh, to uh, better march towards uh, a submittal of an application here in the future. Um, if folks would like, um, maybe we can go around uh, for folks that are with us today, welcome to uh, jump in in the comment section. Let us know uh, who you are, the organization that you represent, uh, and if there are any themes or projects you have identified of interest, please let us know. 
and maybe we can uh, follow up in a Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, welcome Peter. Peter, thank you so much and uh, pass it to you if that's all right. Great. Thank you, Garvin. Um, thank you all for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk to you today and I appreciate a lot the opportunity. Tech Night is an intimidating title, so I'll try and think about any elements of this that are techie um, and otherwise can talk more about how this uh, might impact some of the work that you're already doing. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that this will really be a, a conversation. So I know there's a range of knowledge and exposure to what this is. Um, so my goal is to share some basics and uh, get everyone up to speed on what this initiative entails um, and then really open it up to go deeper on parts that are interesting to you. And I would love to learn from you about some of the things that, that are true that you're working on and know about in your com communities. Um, I also understand that pre-COVID, this was like a pizza and beer event. So if anyone is cracking a beer and having pizza for lunch right now, I applaud you and <laughs> wish I were joining you. Um, so very briefly, just to introduce myself, I, I'm on staff at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston working uh, to bring the Working Communities Challenge to Maine. Um, I feel extremely fortunate to be working on this and also to be, I believe, the sole Boston Fed employee based in Maine. I lived out in Portland. Um, I grew up in Cumberland, actually, and um, went away for about 15 years before moving back several years ago. And most my background is actually mostly in education. I worked uh, first as a public school teacher in Brooklyn, New York for a while. Um, and then I got into education policy and worked for a U.S. senator in Washington, D.C. on education policy. Um, and then I spent uh, about five years out west working with communities from Texas to Hawaii to Washington State, um, supporting local leaders to run for office and to, to do community organizing work and to work at, in policy at the local level uh, around the theme of educational equity. Um, so I moved home to Maine about three years ago, um, worked as a consultant for a stint um, before joining staff at the Fed. Um, and uh, my interest in this initiative is really what brought me back to Maine, which was thinking about having lived in some, some big cities that were gentrifying and seeing the challenges that came with that um, and seeing that happening in Portland and, and hoping that places in Maine that are developing and prosperous can do so in an inclusive way that doesn't force people out, but lets everyone kind of benefit from that prosperity. Um, and then also, you know, Maine is my home and, and knowing a lot of the rural parts of the state um, for now, well over 35 years, uh, and being concerned about kind of what I've seen in some of the places that I really love where opportunity seems harder and harder to come by and folks are not able to access the same level of opportunity that they did in the past. And so what could be true to help link up some places that are finding their footing economically uh, with the prosperity of places like Portland and even Boston, et cetera. Um, so again, I'm going to kind of move somewhat quickly and at a high level to describe the Working Communities Challenge with the goal of getting into conversation with this group. Um, but Garvin, if you want to go to the next slide. I'll just start by sharing a little bit of context for why the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston is working on an, initi on an initiative like this. Um, the entire Federal Reserve system, so as I shared, my background is not as a central banker. Uh, <laughs> so happy to talk about this uh, for, for those that are similarly kind of learning more about the Fed. Um, we have a dual mandate of managing inflation and monetary policy, but then also a mandate around maximizing sustainable employment. And all of the Federal Reserve Banks, um, but Boston's especially focuses on this goal of community development and created the Working Communities Challenge to that end of trying to maximize sustainable employment in, in good jobs that enable a high quality of life across our region, which is Region 1, uh, New England. Next slide. So the initiative itself came from research that was generated by um, the starting question about what is true for places that have had, um, that have been able to rebuild after economic shock, whether that's the closure of a major employer, whether it's kind of long-term economic decline from shifts in the global economy, but places that are kind of 
hard on their luck and thinking about rebuilding and re-envisioning a new economy for its residents, what has been true in those places that have succeeded? And in a nutshell, um, Fed research indicated that uh, having civic leadership from a variety of sectors that come together and collaborate to articulate a long-term goal and then continually working and adapting um, to meet that goal has really been the, the common denominator in places that are so-called resurgent places, those able to rebuild. It wasn't about having kind of one heroic individual dump a bunch of money or articulate a strategy, although sometimes that helps, <laughs> but it's really about getting a team of people uh, to come together and work um, persistently on a shared goal. Next slide. So out of that came the Working Cities Challenge first, as Garvin mentioned, um, which is a partnership, it, it, the Working Cities Challenge first in cities um, across Southern New England in those states, um, kind of mid-sized cities, although actually even in, in Providence, some of the larger cities, I'm sorry, in Rhode Island, some of the larger cities like Providence participated and in Connecticut, some larger cities as well. Um, and now the Working Communities Challenge in Northern New England. So my colleague Steve Michon and I have been working with Vermont. Um, Vermont's about a year ahead of Maine and is in a different stage, which has been really beneficial to us um, in Maine because we have to learn some lessons about doing this in rural communities uh, and now in Maine. Um, and the Working Communities Challenge is a partnership between Maine, the, the Boston Fed, private sector, philanthropy and communities. It's a three and a half year grant opportunity in two parts to strengthen Maine's rural towns, regions, and small cities. And it supports ambitious collaborative leadership teams that build strong economies and healthy communities uh, with a focus on residents who have lower income. Uh, next one. Um, so this is our steering advisory committee and I won't read every name. I just wanted to give you all a peek uh, to, to confirm what I just said, that we really tried to build a steering committee that was cross-sector and brought in people from a variety of backgrounds, um, which is what we're doing that at a state level and also what we anticipate seeing among teams at the local level. Uh, next slide, Gary. And actually you can go to the next slide is a prettier version of this one, frankly. Uh, so we've raised about $2.7 million for this effort. And uh, this slide shows uh, the pretty diverse range of really generous sponsors that we've had contributing to this effort. You'll see um, there's state dollars, there's federal dollars through entities such as the Northern Border Regional Commission, uh, there's philanthropic dollars, uh, local philanthropies you'll see here, uh, the Alphon Foundation, Gorman Sewell, uh, and others. And then also um, national philanthropy uh, has been a part of the Working Cities Challenge and the Working Communities Challenge in Maine. Next slide. So I am going to pause on this slide and really dig in because this is truly the backbone of the initiative. Um, this is the shared goal statewide um, and then also kind of the North Star goal for teams that are thinking about assembling an application and participating and kind of how they can situate their goal. Um, so I'll read it. The main working communities challenge supports local teams working together to improve economic outcomes for all people in Maine's towns, cities, and rural communities. Successful teams will address economic growth and reduce inequity of opportunity tied to race, ethnicity, and other aspects of identity and background. Um, and then these principles live in the process of the Working Communities Challenge, as well as the goals that teams articulate um, and kind of the way that we think about our technical assistance and support. Uh, this is a pretty hands-on opportunity. So teams that are selected to participate will really be entering uh, like a learning community. Um, and over the arc of the three and a half years, uh, we'll get a lot of coaching, have access to workshops and learn from each other as peers across the state. Um, so those principles that um, inform all of that are number one, a cross-sector team of leaders from private, public, nonprofit and the community working towards an ambitious shared goal. Um, engaging community residents and setting direction and decision making, the idea that this is not, um, not done to people but with people and that people who are experiencing the challenges or opportunities in a place are participating in the process of addressing them. 
Um, economic inclusion, racial equity, and diversity across age, gender, and sexual orientation are an important part of, process, of the process and the shared goal. Um, and again, that's really rooted in um, creating economic opportunity and making sure that a place is thinking exhaustively about all the resources that it has um, to build its future. Uh, system solutions, not just programs to achieve a team's shared goal. Um, so the idea of this initiative is for this group of people to come together and say, hey, what are the systems that are holding a problem in place or that are preventing us from maximizing an opportunity? And how can we start to change those systems uh, as ourselves, as leaders of our organizations, as individuals, et cetera? Um, learning and adaptation through research, data, and peer exchange, uh, and then connections to ideas, people, and markets within and across local economies and communities. And again, this is something, this idea of connections to people, ideas, and markets, it's really meant to foster connections within a place, kind of at the local level, within the state, across the state of Maine, and then even to, to foster some connection with and learning from other communities across New England. And that's one of the, I think one of the values add that we can provide as the Boston Fed as that convener. Next slide. Also, I see uh, I'm, I'm not good at looking at the chat and reading while I'm talking. So feel free to interrupt if there's anything in the chat. Uh, and I see, I'm eager to read a bit more about people's backgrounds where they're coming from once we start talking. Garvin, can you go to the next slide for this one? Great, thank you. Uh, so these are two examples I'll just briefly touch upon to illustrate kind of what this has looked like in other places. Um, so in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, the team that came together, as you can see from the list here, was comprised of multi-sector, various players, um, uh, community groups, kind of um, social services organizations, the arts are represented in the Fitchburg Museum, the city had a role as a municipality, um, the, there's an educational entity in Fitchburg State University, the private sector is represented in Enterprise Bank, and collectively this team focused on uh, a part of Fitchburg, the north of Maine neighborhood, um, which was kind of an underdeveloped, low-income, struggling place um, that people wanted to support in kind of reinventing itself and building a stronger future. And critically, they wanted to do that in such a way that the people who were currently there were a part of that um, increased prosperity and opportunity and not displaced as the place itself became nicer. So that was their, that's a big long-term goal. That's a 10-year goal. And um, that formed the backbone of their application. Um, and the team members kind of worked on this goal and contributed in a variety of different ways. And the Working Communities Challenge was a catalyst for them to do that. Um, so I can share more uh, when we get into discussion if people are interested, but that's just one, one example. That's kind of a place-based as well as people-based goal. Uh, and then more recently, an example um, from Vermont is Greater Barrie, um, which is a, it's a multi-town um, application uh, but focused on, on Barrie. Uh, and their goal is to boost the employment rate and reduce the poverty rate by 15 percentage point for single mothers. So you can see they got pretty granular and identified a population of people that the team members knew about and knew uh, and had some and kind of tested this idea before that if some good interventions and some different ways of operating were in place, um, single mothers specifically could um, really have greater access to employment opportunities. So uh, you can see again, the team members are comprised of a cross-sector group, again, social service organizations, nonprofits, United Ways there. Um, the Central Vermont Medical Center is a major employer, government representation, um, Community College of Vermont, et cetera. Um, and I should also mention, you see resident voices um, at the decision-making table are, um, single mothers, women who have kind of experienced the challenge of trying to advance in their careers, move into a good paying job, um, and balance that with being a single mother. Uh, next slide, Garvin. Um, so this, the opportunity itself is really a two-part opportunity. Uh, the first is a design grant of $25,000 for a six-month phase to get to know the working community's approach and for teams to gel from kind of a rough idea of this is who our team is and this is what we think we want to work on to 
hone that and really think about um, a, more of a firm commitment to a long-term goal that they're working on together and to tighten up that team. Um, it's also a chance just to see if this is something that teams want to get themselves into. Um, there are eight awards for this for this section, um, and there's about six workshops that we run, uh, again, to dig deeper into those principles and kind of give people some of the background to try on some of the aspects of the initiative. And there's coaching that's provided as well as uh, those workshops. Um, and then implementation grant, the second part of the two-part opportunity, uh, five teams that participate in the first phase um, will apply for and be selected for three-year three, three year implementation grants of up to $375,000 per team um, to support those collaborative leadership teams to really start to take on the first three years of that big 10-year um, challenge or opportunity that they've identified. And then there also is access to innovation grants along the way as teams kind of see opportunities where a little extra funding might make a difference. Um, again, as we've said, this, this initiative funds cross-sector leadership teams to identify and then start to tackle ambitious shared goals. Um, teams need to represent communities and regions with high economic need. There's an emphasis on collective action and collaborative leadership to change systems that can either unlock opportunities or change the systems that are holding a problem in place. Um, and I, yeah, we've said that there's a focus on improving lives of people with low moderate incomes. Garvin, if you want to jump to the next one. Um, this is a timeline slide. Yeah, that's okay, Garvin. I'm actually not going to spend much time on that. The top of that one says what makes a working community's challenge different. If you want to talk about that, we can talk more about that in discussion. Um, key dates for the next one. Um, December 1st is when the letter of interest is due. I can talk more about that and what that entails. Again, if that's an area where people want to dig in. Uh, keep, keep going, Garvin. Um, so the design and implementation phase, I'll pause briefly here, uh, kind of reiterate, I think what I just said, I just wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, the real focus in this design phase, again, is trying on the model and then testing out, playing around with some of the ideas that the team might have about what could be done to address the challenge or opportunity they're thinking about. And then the focus in the implementation phase is that long-term commitment um, staffing up the work um, and launching some of the strategies the team has identified. The other thing I just can't emphasize enough is that learning and adaptation is fundamental to this initiative. Um, and so there's no point, I believe, where we say, you know, you put that down on paper. And so just because conditions have changed, <laughs> that's what you need to keep doing. Uh, the focus here is really being responsive to conditions and deeper understanding of a problem or new voices coming in to change this, the uh, strategies. You can go to the next slide, Garvin. I think we'll share these. So um, again, there's some details that might be useful if you're thinking about participating, but I won't read the whole timeline here. Uh, next slide. Um, similarly, uh, again, if there's appetite to talk about what teams have done to be successful in the design phase, happy to do that. Um, but Keep rolling for now. So I'll, I'll briefly just explain who can participate um, in the Working Communities Challenge. Uh, and every town in Maine can be a part of an application. So if you don't see the town you're in uh, listed as a priority community, that does not mean you're boxed out. However, um, each application does need to include a priority community. Um, so multiple communities can join together to submit an application as a collective of as a collection of places or a region. And um, some may need to do that to get to the appropriate population scale. So the total population of the communities in an application must be a minimum of 6,000 people. So in our list of priority communities, there are some places actually fewer than that. So they'll be partnering with other towns necessarily. Um, and then I'll also just say uh, kind of why we even have priority communities. We didn't want teams to feel like in their applications they needed to be making the case that they had levels of economic need. In fact, one of the things we heard loud and clear from our steering committee, who has a really active role in designing this, is um, that there's, you know, there's need in different ways all over the state. And we wanted to keep kind of an open door, which is why we have so many priority communities. Um, but we also wanted teams in your applications to be focused on what you want to tackle together and how you might do that. So um, 
that, that's a little bit of the rationale for having this. Um, and the actual criteria itself was places that had a poverty rate of 12% or higher, uh, I believe the statewide average is about 12.5% in the data that we pulled in 2018, which admittedly, that's the most recent data available. Admittedly, we know that those numbers are being impacted by COVID and the um, economic hardship related to it. Uh, however, that we went with the data that we had most readily available. Um, also knowing that a lot of the existing inequalities have only been exacerbated by, by COVID. Um, and population-wise places with at least uh, 1,900 um, people in them. And then I should also say that in addition to the 75 towns listed, Native American tribal communities in Maine are invited to apply as priority communities. And we made a decision as a steering committee to exempt them from the requirement that the application contained 6,000 people. And that was kind of rooted in our value of equity. And I'm happy to share a little more about that if people want when we're discussing. Uh, next slide, Garvin. Yeah, so this slide would be the most relevant for people who are thinking about joining a team or becoming a part of a team. Um, uh, but at this stage, again, it's really about brainstorming. It's really about thinking about the people in a place who might want to work on a challenge or an opportunity together, um, connecting with each other. Um, and the first step is that letter of interest, which is very short, pretty straightforward. Um, and that's to be submitted by, uh, by December 1st. Um, and I will pause there. I think those are actually repeats. Um, so whenever we send this out, we can delete those last three slides. Um, so, so as I mentioned, I was a, I was a teacher, I was a middle school teacher and I just violated like the chief rule by talking way too long. Uh, so I know that was just a lot of listening, uh, but I would love to, you know, have a little more of a conversation now and hear, um, happy to answer any questions or hear about things that felt really meaningful or interesting to you and want to learn more about. Peter, thank you so much. Uh, really nice overview. I know uh, that you and your team have been doing a lot of these information sessions the last uh, week and month, frankly, as well. So thank you for your time. Um, really wonderful uh, and rich with information. Uh, for folks that would like to do a question, uh, feel free to drop it into the chat or uh, if you feel more comfortable, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and then just, uh, Lest I forget, I do want to give a shout out and plug to KV Cog. Uh, they do have a link in the chat feature where uh, I believe uh, that KV Cog is hosting a meeting on November 16th. Uh, but please uh, check that time and date uh, internally with KV Cog. And uh, thank you to KV Cog. Uh, so maybe I will get us uh, kicked off here. Uh, Peter, you touched on some of these case models and lessons from away and how the program has evolved, um, which is really spectacular to hear. Can you give us just a, a high level overview on a community that you thought did a particularly nice job and maybe what some of the key uh, outputs or outcomes were? And if you noticed any kind of success factors that led to that community having such strong outcomes, what were those? Yep. So in addition to Fitchburg, um, which I think is a good example, but another community um, from the very first round of the Working Cities Challenge is Chelsea, Massachusetts. And that's a helpful um, reference point because it was from the first round. So it's been going for quite a while. And we've seen that some of the things that they started to do have continued. Um, and Chelsea decided to tackle crime. Um, they felt that the, the crime in their community was preventing it from being a desirable place for people to move into, for businesses to move into, as well as just, you know, an, a, a safe and, and happy place to raise families and, and live. Um, and I think the distinction here is that because they approached it in this kind of collaborative leadership um, way, uh, they brought in a lot of entities and stakeholders that you might not typically think about as crafting a response to crime. So they had uh, the, the um, pu uh, public education system had a pretty prominent role in this one. Um, the police department was at the table, the town was at the table, local business leaders were at the table, local nonprofits were at the table. 
And it led to it led to reduction in crime over time, but it also led to some interventions like new relationships between law enforcement, the education system, and the city. Um, a real voice for business leaders in kind of the state of downtown and what it was kind of what was needed to have um, a more prosperous downtown. And it really led to systems change. Like it led to the way. It led to changes in the way that existing organizations were operating with relation to each other. We heard a lot of things like, um, you know, these organizations and people had been working side by side for a long time, but they had never engaged in the same way. And the solutions that they came up with had never developed because of that. So that's that's one example. Um, there's another example that is a good one because there's a New York Times article written about it, so I can send you the link to the article. <laughs> but Lawrence, Massachusetts is similarly um, another, uh, another community from the first stage in Massachusetts. And um, I'll send you the link to the article so you can take a look at it later. And I realize these are, these are pretty different places than Maine, but I think you'll get the idea that it's multiple entities coming together to kind of modify how they operate and work together and also to work relentlessly on a long-term goal. Um, so feel free to check that out if you'd like. And then we also have a bunch more examples um, on our website. Uh, so if you want to peruse further, feel free to, to take a look. I will say, Garvin, one thing that I'm just really excited about with Maine and, and uh, Vermont is that we're applying these principles to smaller places than has ever been done in Southern New England. Um, and I think some of that, like collaborative leadership is in some ways is baked into smaller places in a different way than a big cities. Um, and in other ways, I think, it, I, I think it can be more challenging because of different um, levels of resources, et cetera. So the Fed, bigger picture, the Fed is really trying to be more present and do more um, outside of Massachusetts across the district. And this is a really important jumping off point for us to learn more about rural economies, uh, et cetera. Uh, thank you for that, Peter, and really great point. And just uh, for folks that are paying attention to the chat, uh, the reference to the New York Times link is in there. And the image on the beginning of the deck is Rumford. So um, good win there. Peter, you touched on this and just kind of dovetailing to your comment about collaboration. Um, can you just help us underscore uh, as the community is looking to do coalition building and consensus building, as we look at themes and projects, why is cross-sector stakeholder involvement so important uh, to this initiative, to its success, uh, as well as, of course, to the evaluation in a competitive uh, application process? Yep. Um, well, it really comes back to that initial research and then that research being and affirmed by the experience of rolling out the Working Cities Challenge. So um, what the research indicated, and kind of makes sense. I mean, I'm sure we've seen examples of this in various ways um, in, in all of our communities, but when more stakeholders care about a problem and authentically come together to work on it, um, they're able to bring all of the assets of their respective fields. So. You know, a nonprofit trying to tackle an issue by itself may be doing an outstanding job, but they're just not going to have the same set of resources. They're going to have different way, like mindsets and ways of operating to contribute. They're going to have different relationships to leverage than um, a business, than a government leader, et cetera. So this is really meant to be an excuse to work together and an excuse to build upon a lot of the collaboration that already happens in different ways and to strengthen that. Um, so that's, yeah, in a nutshell, that's kind of why it's it's a priority. Um, and again, it's really about the, the, the forces that have led to places struggling economically in the economy right now are so strong. Um, and to combat some of those macroeconomic forces is really a, an all hands on deck um, need. Right, uh, thank you for that. And uh, Peter, a question in the uh, comments section here. How are the voices of residents included and what weight is given to those voices and or have you seen instances of uh, empowerment? Uh, I assume empowerment of uh, those residents and those voices that are coming to the table. 
Um, <clears throat> great question, Jennifer. So uh, it has looked different in different places in terms of the how the voices uh, of residents are included. Where we've seen where we've seen it the most meaningful is in places that have been really intentional about not advancing on their goal or, or theory of change until they've genuinely engaged people who are living whatever challenge and listen to kind of how important it is, what their lived experience has been and have been really thoughtful. And I, this is all stuff that I'm sure you all are doing in your respective roles, but like been really thoughtful about how they're meeting with people who have different backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different levels of education, different types of jobs and live in different places and like are able to really engage in a way that levels the playing field and invites people to contribute their experiences um, and fully participate. So I think um, like the best applications do this the most um, and the places that have seen the most success are those where the civic leadership has really committed to thinking about how they operate and how they communicate and how they, what kind of information they um, say is valid and legitimate um, and maybe modifying some of that uh, in order to make sure they're getting all the insights and experiences that they can. Um, and so, yeah, anecdotally, we have seen instances of empowerment um, and we've seen people be authentic you know, parts of the decision-making table. And this has been an avenue to, to leadership. Um, and then the other thing that's just useful sometimes is paying people. <laughs> and, and like, if, if you're asking someone uh, particularly, you know, for a lot of us doing something like this might be a part of our job, but if you're asking people for whom it's not a part of their job, and in fact, maybe the insights they have that are so valuable are because they're in a low wage job and have to have several jobs, then then to ask for their time uh, should be compensated. And that's one of the purposes of the $25,000 in the um, design phase. A lot of teams have used that to compensate volunteers. Um, and then also the, the money in the three-year grant too. Can, some of that can be used for that. And maybe uh, as it relates to that, and thank you for the great question, Jennifer. So in geared towards maybe folks that are just becoming familiar with this initiative, as Peter touched on, uh, a two-phase uh, grant, if you will, a design phase, and then hopefully a successful and implementation phase. Uh, both phases come with uh, competitive grant funding opportunities. Uh, as folks may know, there's a variety of types of grants, whether it's for R&D, planning purposes, technical assistance, maybe uh, capital improvement type grants that help contribute to actually uh, the building physical buildings or infrastructure. Peter, do you mind touching on the nature of this grant and what you've seen in the past on uh, some kind of more prototypical uses of funds? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Garvin, because we're definitely, number one, we're, we're not trying to duplicate um, what's already out there. Um, and when you saw our steering committee, you could see that there were a lot of um, entities participating in this who actually do other kind of giving and give directly for um, you know, small scale infrastructure or other approaches that are also really valuable. And we know that there's you know, enormous need across the board in a variety of different ways. So what this opportunity is really for is um, leveraging those dollars to Kind of assemble and staff the leadership table that's going to be working together um, and providing enough money for some programming, some stipends for community members, but really providing the human capital um, to build that connection and quarterback um, the meetings and the actions that that group has to take together to modify um, the systems that are true, that are in a place. So long way of saying mostly on people um, and people um, much more, not infrastructure, um, a little bit of programming. Um, and then what we've also seen too is that this, um, and for those of you that were on the info session, if any of you were with Nicole Witherby, she spoke to this, but you know, kind of demonstrating impact often begets more resources. And so we've seen that in other places too, that um, as needs have arisen for different kinds of funding to expand and accelerate the work that teams are doing, 
um, other players have stepped in and have, been, have contributed um, toward that. Another note actually to that end is, and this is a question I have for the group too, but um, so one suggestion we're making is that teams think about the 10-year um, the economic development plan put out by the state last year, at the end of last year. Um, given that there are a lot of uh, stakeholders invested in that plan, the goals and the strategies in that plan, and kind of broad alignment with some of that plan might open up additional resources because so many people are kind of thinking about it and thinking about those goals. So um, that's one suggestion. Great, and for folks not familiar, you can find that plan uh, by Googling DCD and Maine uh, State Economic Development Strategy, uh, or just let us know if you are needing access to that. Um, it looks like we have another question coming in from uh, Nancy, hi Nancy. Um, the question being, when is an idea for system change too big? Uh, and uh, the follow-up question, what about state legislative initiatives? Uh, I, I guess as an example of maybe too big of a uh, system change project. Yeah, actually, Nancy, if you're able to take yourself off mute, can you share a little bit more about your question? Oh, hi. hi. Yes. Can, yeah. Hi. Hi there. Again, I'm sorry. Um, just just trying to get a uh, an understanding of when you say you know system change and people are writing back and forth about big change, big B I G, big capital change. Sure. Um, you know, you can always think about how we could change the whole state or something that right. we want to do in a community. Really requires a bigger initiative. Yeah. That doesn't feel like what I see happened in Massachusetts. Those are more community oriented, more tightly yep, woven yep. within what those communities need. Things that the local city council could, for example, initiate. And that's actually my, my follow up question of that is how important is city government in this initiative? I mean, have cities played uh, just a go along role or do they need to really be involved? Do you, do you want to see city uh, staff working, for example, along with the nonprofits? You know, it, it looks like for Fitchburg, maybe it's nonprofits that have been driving the effort, but maybe that's just what I see online and not really what's uh, the, the whole picture. Got it, yep. Good, good question and a lot in that question actually. So one thing, I think thinking about it at the community level is the right approach. So it is centered on kind of a town or city or collection of towns and cities. Could be, I mean, it could be as big as a, a county or some other larger unit too. Um, and actually I should say, be, you can be creative about the region. It doesn't have to be like a traditional government designation. If you wanna identify a region that has similar markets or needs, then that could be a unit to think about for this application too. Um, but you're absolutely right that it's about articulating, okay, what is, what needs to be different in this place to afford more economic opportunity for low and moderate income people? And I think where it might differ from what a town or city could do is, again, it's, it's an opportunity and it's funding to bring new players into a problem and work on addressing it together by building this table. So whereas a city or town might be able to provide funding for an initiative or a program um, to address a specific problem, um, this is an opportunity to say, great, like let's have that at the table, but then let's also have an employer at the table and um, let's also have a, a nonprofit at the table and a school system, et cetera. So, for example, if you were thinking about a workforce challenge, like the city might have um, some intervention that they're doing, uh, but then, you know, it, it, maybe it's not getting as far as it can because some of the big employers haven't changed how they think about who's credentialed to take some of the jobs that are entry level or how they might um, support to use greater barriers. As an example, like they're thinking about single mothers specifically. Okay, like what are the barriers that single mothers have experienced when they step into entry level roles that might be holding them back from advancing or from accessing that at all and getting a more diverse group than just one player to think about that question and start to answer to that question. 
Um, so the other thing, there obviously are some things that are just too big. So uh, we do work with teams to focus their goals. You know, uh, my colleague Steve gave the example in one of the info sessions, ending poverty is a very, it's a too big goal probably for, the, for this. Um, but thinking about, okay, um, X number of jobless, um, underemployed um, men from 20 to 40 in a place like what can we do to reduce that underemployment rate over a 10 year period? That's it's pretty big, it's pretty ambitious um, and also is something you can more wrap your, wrap your hands and your heads around. Does that answer your question, Nancy? I... Uh, uh, yes, yes, I, I think, thank you. It's, it's um, yeah, it's a big subject. <laughs> it's a big subject, and sometimes I fall in the buzzword trap, which is why <laughs> feel free to push me on any of it because it's. Well, we all yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, Nancy. Um, just pausing here for a moment uh, for any questions that folks would like to unmute themselves or drop a comment in um, while you're kind of distilling thought here, uh, Peter. And for folks not familiar with Tech Night uh, in our network, Tech Talks. Um, we typically like to ask the entrepreneur or the startup or the initiative uh, where they see themselves going in the next five years. Uh, so just given that, um, maybe opening up the aperture and stepping back, um, where do you see this initiative, uh, hopefully within the next five years and some of the uh, roles it's played in improving the state's economy? Good question. That's a fun one to think ahead to. Um, so I think in hopefully in all eight of the communities, but especially in the five communities that are participating in the multi-year um, grant, um, we'll see kind of a new openness to partner with in, in unexpected ways um, for new coalitions to have emerged in these places and to be making real progress towards this 10-year goals as identified in those in those places, um, I'm really op I'm really excited about the possibility of increased connectivity across the state. Um, you know, my folks live up in Aquasic near Rangeley, and it's a very different place than where I live in Portland. And I think that both places have things to learn from both places, <laughs> and so I think that plays out all over the state. Um, and kind of creating more bridges between places even within Maine. Um, so in five years, more bridges will be built. Uh, and this could be one vehicle for people to be sharing ideas, sharing strategies, um, and, and tackling similar problems from different angles in different places. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, fundamentally, this is about creating economic opportunity. And so, um, Again, it depends on the place, but there are places where you'll have maybe many more workers who are well positioned to uh, be nimble in an economy and to um, work in an emerging sector, whether it's aquaculture or kind of a new cultural sector or uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and I think that holds a lot of potential. Um, I think, too, we've heard a lot of conversation about um, kind of an appetite to make Maine more welcoming to people from away, whether it's domestic migrants from other parts of the United States, whether it's international migrants, um, knowing our human capital constraints and the fact that our population is, is aging, um, thinking about what can we do to make this a really appealing place um, for, for newcomers, as well as the people who are already here having more opportunity. Great, uh, thank you so much for that. And I, I think we all kind of share in wanting to see that uh, vision as well. And it, it is, an, what an exciting opportunity. Um, Jennifer has a, a question in the comment here. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Uh, because of Maine's rural uh, semi-urban nature, uh, Jennifer's curious to know if the, uh, the Boston Fed has funded a collaboration uh, to improve uh, food security as well as the local economy. So a question here around uh, using this initiative or others to improve food security. So with 90% certainty, Jennifer, I'll say, no, they haven't. Um, I'm always uncovering things I didn't know were happening at the Fed, but <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. And I should say too, you know, fundamental, our, our work is a tiny sliver actually of what the Fed does. Um, 
overwhelmingly it's around monetary policy and managing um, that in New England and then also offering guidance to the um, Board of Governors in DC. Um, and then we also are really a research entity. So we do produce a lot of research around uh, economic trends and opportunities in the first district in New England. Um, and it's possible we did some research on food security, but I, none that I'm aware of. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, part of, uh, part of this engagement is the Fed learning more. And I think the research team that I work with and um, the New England Public Policy Center are always curious kind of what's top of mind and most relevant for people in Maine and other parts of New England. And so that's interesting that you ask that. Great, uh, thank you. Um, just pausing here for any other questions. Uh, looks like we have a question here uh, from Fran of Healthy Northern Kennebec. Uh, thank you for the question, Fran. Would you please talk about the support and training for the learning uh, communities in Maine? Um, and then just a, it sounds like this with regards to technology transfer and or data sharing. Great. And I assume, Fran, I assume your question means the learning communities embedded in the working communities challenge. Is that right? Versus there's not. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so participants in both phases of the initiative will participate in workshops and receive coaching around kind of the fundamentals of the initiative. So things like collaborative leadership, doing work around actually living the value of economic inclusion um, by a variety of different kind of factors. Um, how do you identify an ambitious shared goal and work towards that? And our goal and uh, our commitment is to meet people where they are. So uh, kind of getting an uh, understanding and knowledge of who the team is and what experiences they've had and then building off of that and facilitating kind of connection between the people, uh, between teams as well. Um, and, um, and then I think one thing that's a real opportunity here too is for us to learn through the teams where the need is. So for example, if data gathering and data analysis um, is something that is really holding back a team, um, then that might be a focus of some of the supports and training uh, that we provide. Um, if there's stuff that's more in the lane of kind of the um, racial equity work or, or work around creating a more inclusive place, like maybe that's the orientation. So we have some best guesses and theories about kind of where the uh, support and training will focus, but we also want to be really responsive to what people need based on what, what uh, they're working on. And I'll just say the how too is um, I and my colleague Steve will work directly with teams. We're also hiring a main based consultant who will be with us for the duration of uh, this opportunity and we do bring in other um, consultants and people um, both from New England and then and then actually too kind of as relevant. We want to walk the line between uh, being aware of and contextualizing for Maine's really unique context um, and then also like we hope this will be an opportunity to take advantage of some national resources too that might not be here all the time. Great, uh, thank you for that and thank you for the question Fran. Uh, just pause in here briefly for any questions or comments. And Carmen, can I ask a, a question in the last few minutes here? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'd just be really curious to hear from, from people. What are some of the like challenges or issues that you're thinking about when we talk about kind of the, the systems change approach and long-term challenges that need to be addressed? Curious what your experiences have been. Any folks want to volunteer? I know we've heard uh, ideas around housing and community land trust models. Um, we've heard some ideas around revitalization. We've heard ideas around uh, rural broadband and telematics. Um, we've heard ideas around uh, youth, uh, youth generally speaking, how we attract uh, talent, uh, but also how we contribute uh, to youth. Uh, and I think subtext being probably the state of Maine's largest uh, with the exception of COVID of course, and not to minimize that, uh, the state's labor economics with that aging population, declining population, which has meant that reduction in the working age population. 
Um, so if anybody would like to touch on those, but I know uh, so those are some topics and themes that I've uh, heard from some folks here today, as well as others that are not. Food insecurity is another one, G. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Food insecurity, uh, as a reference, is also another one. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, for those that are um, thinking about this for the first time, really uh, want to head nod and plug, again, KB Cog uh, hosting a get together on the 16th at 11, uh, excuse me, at 11 o'clock. Um, and nice timing there and keeping in mind uh, those letters uh, needing to be submitted on December 1st. So we are marching to a, a, a due date to think about uh, these qu questions and particularly uh, Peter's question there. Uh, I think we've had a, a couple of comments come in here. Uh, Fran has a comment about um, the Fed's webpage, excellent data, um, certainly would concur. Uh, Mike, thank you for the comment, Mike. Uh, facilitating kind of open dialogue. Um, you know, I really like both these comments and not to go down the rabbit hole, but Peter mentioned that, you know, what a wonderful opportunity. And thank you, Peter, for joining us again. But what a wonderful opportunity for communities to focus, uh, do a needs assessment, look to create systems change, uh, but then beyond just the scope of the grant, really to partner and work with an incredible institution like the Boston Fed that can bring value add, whether it's uh, data analysis or an expertise on a particular industry. So, uh, you know, what a compelling opportunity that I, I hope that we all get to work on together. I'll just share too, the one thing we heard from Vermont as they have wrapped up that first design phase of six months is that even in six months, um, this catalyzed uh, kind of different relationships, different ways of talking about certain problems that they said felt really useful. And even if they weren't selected, they thought would continue. So um, we've seen some evidence of that in other communities as well. So even that first phase can really start a conversation in a different way. Um, so that's our goal is to be a catalyst to help build upon the great work that, that you all are doing already um, and to support that. Um, so very excited to, to dig in more. All right, well, um, so not seeing anything else. So with that, I'd like to, again, uh, thank our sponsors uh, for this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much to CGI, Thomas Colleges, Harold Alphon Institute for Business Innovation, uh, Valley Beverage, and our folks that we certainly do miss uh, being with at Bricks Coworking and Innovation Space at 10 Water Street, Pathway Creative Center, downtown Waterville, Maine. Uh, this has been recorded live. Uh, you'll be able to view this uh, at your leisure at a later date or send along uh, to colleagues or friends. Uh, you'll be able to find this on the Central Maine Growth Council website, centralmaine.org. Uh, we'll also be uploading this to YouTube, so you should be able to find it uh, through a simple Google search as well. Uh, any follow-up questions or remarks, we're happy to uh, help uh, field those, so just please let us know. Uh, and then again, I would encourage folks uh, to join for the KB Cog meeting, uh, where I do believe we'll be getting into a discussion uh, amongst uh, many things, uh, what some of these themes and projects might look like. Uh, so again, uh, Peter, thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, and we look forward to seeing everybody uh, next month uh, for our December uh, Tech Talk. Cheers and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Garvin. Thanks, everyone.